Good evening. My name is Heather Zwicker, and I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Queensland. Mr. Sang Wu Hong, Consul General of Korea, keynote speaker, the Honorable Professor Garth Evans, ACQC, distinguished honorary professor from the Australian National University and form, former Foreign Affairs Minister, keynote speaker, Professor Chung In Moon, Special Advisor in Foreign Affairs and National Security to President He, Mr. Moon Jae-in, Republic of Korea, members of the University Senate and the University Senior Leadership Group, Ms. Susan Lee, Vice Chairperson for the National Unification Advisory Council, Honorary Associate Professor Jae Hoon Jung, Co-Director of the Korean Studies Center at UQ, representatives from government and industry, friends, donors, colleagues, and distinguished guests. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to this, the fourth webinar hosted by the UQ Korean Studies Center in collaboration with the Asia Pacific Assembly of the National Unification Advisory Council, or NUAC, Korea. On behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and on behalf of all of us here today, I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we find ourselves. I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. As ever, it is a distinct pleasure to introduce Ms. Susan Lee, who is not only Vice Chair of the National Unification Advisory Council, but also a great friend to Haas. Susan, I know you have a few words to say. Thank you, Professor Heta Zwicka. It has been already one year since we met in Brisbane at the launch of the Korean Studies Center, along with Professor Tim Dunn. Pro Vice Chancellor, who has joined us for his congratulatory remarks. I will have to take this opportunity to express the Korean Australian community's unreserved appreciation of the University of Queensland's robust approaches to the Korea related issues. I also consider myself being honored to have an opportunity to welcome Professor Moon Jong in one of the most renowned experts in international affairs and Korean Peninsula issues. And Honorable Professor Gareth Evans, former Foreign Affairs Minister and former Chancellor of the Australian National University. In my capacity as the, as the head of the Asia Pacific Assembly of the National Unification Advisory Council, representing more than 600 Korean community leaders in the 20 nations in the regions. I cannot but stress that your contributions to this webinar will be a milestone for Korean communities in Asia Pacific region, including the homeland. Indeed, your insight into the Korean Peninsula issues will be definitely the most practical guideline for the international communities to follow. In particular, the audience who are joining us this afternoon must be very keen to know how you are perceiving the current situation in the, awake, in the wake of the inauguration of Joe Biden's administration. In this sense, our organization will further collaborate with the UQ's Korean Studies Center to make this webinar more exposed to and reach a wider spectrum of people in the region. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. And thank you, Susan. I can't believe that it's been a year since that event at Customs House, which remains in my memory, one of the most bracing experiences of community engagement that I've experienced as a Dean of Haas. Really a terrific event. Um, I will shortly have the pleasure of handing the session over to Professor Tim Dunn. 
Pro Vice Chancellor and Deputy Provost of the University of Queensland, who has kindly agreed to come this evening to represent the Vice Chancellor, who wishes that she could have been here but has a previous engagement. Professor Dunn is a distinguished scholar of international relations in his own right and a tremendous colleague. Tim will introduce the speakers and at the end of presentations, chair a short question and answer session. I believe that we have set up the technology so that mics are muted and videos are off during the sessions. But if that technology does not materialize in that way, may I ask you kindly to, may I say, vacate the Zoom floor for our guest speakers. Would you mind just muting and taking, turning off your video when others are speaking? Thank you very much. Tim, over to you. Thank you, Heather, for that introduction and good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to join you all for what promises to be an inspirational event. I too was there at the, at the event a year ago and it, as Heather has said, it really was an inspirational evening that time and I'm sure it will be this evening too. Now I won't be repeating the generous acknowledgements that Heather has made, other than to also pay my respects to the traditional owners and their custodianship of country, meaning both land, but also the spiritual connection to the past. Before I continue, I must first pass on an apology, not just from the Vice Chancellor, Professor Debbie Terry, but also from our Chancellor, Mr. Peter Varghese AO, who would have joined us this evening had he not been officiating on, uh, in one of the graduation ceremonies that are currently underway. And among that graduating co cohort are almost 50 Korean students, mm -hmm. along with significant numbers of other uh, students from the region. And sadly, due to the ongoing travel restrictions, not as many were able to attend in person as we would have hoped. As a university, we regard the exchange of ideas and different cultural beliefs as being an essential component in building a stronger and more secure region. We also value the generation of new knowledge that can come about through international research collaborations that benefit our two countries. These collaborations are taking place at a time when governments, including our own, are asking critical questions about which universities we are collaborating with and why. We must, of course, be absolutely transparent about our collaborations. We do not fear being open with our own government about which partners we are working for and working with. What we do fear, however, is an operating environment where trust gives way to suspicion and where collaboration makes way for competition. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, it is surely the value of international collaboration over the kind of me-first me politics that is increasingly being associated with the vaccine supply chains. While the pandemic has kept Australia and the Republic of Korea physically apart through 2020 and probably into 2021, we must continue to engage with our region as like-minded partners and friends. I am proud to say, and I'm confident that the former Chancellor of the ANU, Gareth Evans will agree, that the spirit of internationalism flows through the veins of Australian universities. We are truly internationalist in our pursuit of knowledge and science. We are internationalist through the generations of students who leave our university as citizens of the world. We are internationalist in that we believe in an international community of scholars and collaborators. In that respect, if I could adapt a phrase of Hedley Bull, one of the great international relations scholars, also who, um, who developed his career mainly at the Australian National University, Hedley Bull argued that states have to be part of a global community. Similarly, universities do as well. We need also to be local agents of a world common good. Being internationalist means fostering research in language, culture and social practices. These have been the focus of the Korean Studies Centre since it was launched early last year. And as we've already mentioned, many of us had the pleasure of attending and speaking at that event. And I was overwhelmed by the positive outlook and the spirit of hope. As my 13 year old son would put it, there really was a good vibe about that night. It is of course much harder to generate a good vibe 
virtually, but we'll do our best tonight. Through webinars such as this one, the Centre has turned the COVID crisis into an opportunity to use virtual technologies to build strategic partnerships with industry, government and civil society. These three estates, as Hegel called them, are, are the critical ingredients to greater awareness and understanding of Korea in the Australian community. Not only is the Republic of Korea Australia's fourth largest trading partner, we also share key security interests in North Asia and the Indo-Pacific, with peace and stability on the Korean pen pen Peninsula critical to the <coughs> economic prosperity and the security of both our countries. Against the backdrop of China's rising influence and the unpredictable character of America's commitment to its allies, our two countries, both middle powers, have the potential to work ever more closely together to address a host of regional and global challenges. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from two very eminent scholars, Professor Chung In Moon, who will be inaugurated as the chair of the Sejong Institute of the Republic of Korea, and Professor the Honorable Gareth Evans, ACQC. It is set to be a fascinating conversation about the roles of Australia and the Republic of Korea for peaceful coexistence and cooperation in our regions. But first, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Mr. Sangwoo Hong, Consul General of the Republic of Korea. Consul General Hong joined the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1992 after passing his diplomatic service examinations. He has served in a variety of diplomatic postings, including France, Norway, and Germany. Consul General Hong was appointed to his position in 2019, and it is my pleasure on behalf of the Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Queensland to invite him now to address us. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor Don, Professor Tibiker, and Vice-Chairperson Vice Ms. Suzan Lee for very kind introduction and remarks. I'd like to begin by congratulating the Korean Studies Center, the University of Queensland, and the Asia Pacific Assembly of National Unification Advisory Council of Korea on successfully hosting tonight's webinar. And I have a great honor and pleasure to acknowledge prestigious keynote speakers for this event, former Australian Foreign Minister, Professor Gareth Evans, and Professor Moon Jong-in, Special Advisor to the President of Republic of Korea for Foreign Affairs and National Security. This webinar is very time and meaningful in that with the inauguration of a new US, government, US administration, it is expected that there will be many geopolitical changes in the coming years. These changes could serve to enhance the role of the middle powers, such as Korea and Australia. And our joint efforts in promoting peace and security in the Asia Pacific region. As we know, last year, was the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War. Unfortunately, an armistice has still been in place. The war has not yet formally ended. For those 70 years, the Korean government, along with the international community, has made a tremendous effort to build a permanent peace in the Korean Peninsula, but has yet to achieve satisfactory results. Given the geopolitical importance of the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, the pursuit of the lasting peace remains not only the highest priority of Korean, Korea's foreign policy, and also represents one of the most important challenges in the Asia Pacific region. Since the PyeongChang Winter Olympic Games in 2018, there have been some truly historic moments for inter-Korean relations and the US-North US Korea dialogues. Although we are in, now in, in a stalemate in the nuclearization talks, the peace process in the Korean Peninsula is still ongoing and the, the core principles and the agreements are firm and valid today. The recent inauguration of the US administration may provide new international environments which will open new possibilities to renew the dialogues 
between the United States and North Korea. In this regard, the Korean government will further strength the Korea-US alliance and spare no efforts in moving forward with the United States-North Korea relations and inter-Korean dialogues for achieving the permanent peace in the Korean Peninsula. Korea and Australia have always been side by side in our pursuit of peace and prosperity in the region. This year is the very significant to the bilateral relationship of our two nations, as it marks the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between our two countries. I firmly believe that this year will serve as a new momentum for us to develop into a higher level of strategic partnership and to further deepen the friendship and the cooperation we already enjoy. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the, import the importance of global leadership more than ever before. In this context, the solidarity and active engagement of middle powers like Korea and Australia has become very crucial to overcoming this global crisis. This year is expected to be an important step in the beginning of the global recovery from this pandemic. I believe that this year will also serve as a new starting point for, for the journey toward building a lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Once again, I would like to thank the Korean Studies Center of University of Queensland and the Asia Pacific Assembly of NUA Korea for holding this very meaningful event so that we might reflect upon Korea and Australia's role in the global leadership and what we can achieve together and the significance of the peace and the prosperity of the Korean Peninsula and the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Consul General, for those excellent remarks. It is now my pleasure to introduce the first of this evening's keynote speaker, the Honorable Pro Professor Gareth Evans, ACQC. Gareth is well known to many of us as one of Le Australia's leading authorities on international relations, political affairs and conflict prevention. He was one of the longest serving and most influential foreign ministers in Australian history, holding that post from 1988 to 1996. From 2000 to 2009, he was president and CEO of the Brussels based International Crisis Group. And from 2010 to 2019, served as chancellor of the Australian National University where he is, he is now Distinguished Honorary Professor. I know Gareth isn't keen on overly long introductions, so I'll simply add that what I have said leaves out a whole lot. Oh, just one more thing. Gareth is a writer and public intellectual of the highest repute. It's my great pleasure to invite him to address us now, Gareth. Well, thanks very much, Tim, for those very generous remarks. Thanks to everyone at UQ. Thanks to Consul General Hong and all the distinguished cast of speakers that it's my privilege to join. I'm getting a bit edgy about the condition of the battery on my iPad at the moment. So if we have a catastrophic blackout and I have to shift to another machine halfway through, I hope you'll forgive me. Fingers crossed. Australia-Korea relations, although they're very strong, have really never quite reached their full potential. And it's absolutely time that they did. Economically, in people-to-people, -people, social and cultural terms, despite the best efforts of UQ, the universities, but above all in political and security terms. Given the very present fraught and fragile character of so much of the regional environment, with China under Xi Jinping now so openly assertive, the Korean Peninsula still obviously an acute source of tension, and the United States uh, having, even with Joe Biden, a real struggle now to retain the, to rebuild the credibility that is so comprehensively squandered under the presidency of Donald Trump. There are really quite firm foundations on which we can build our relationship in this geopolitical space. It was Prime Minister Bob Hawke's visit to Seoul in January 89 that saw the conception of the APEC process, born in Canberra 10 months later at a conference that I had the privilege of chairing as Foreign Minister. And I remember well uh, how closely and productively uh, Korean and Australian ministers and officials did work together as APEC evolved over the next few years first in finding a way of embracing Taiwan as well as China in the process, and then in adding a leaders meeting to the institutional framework of this centrally important regional cooperation exercise. 
I also remember very well participating, albeit as a marginal rather than as a central player, in the agreed framework, the keto for negotiations of the mid-1990s, the first serious attempt made to deal with the prospect of North Korean nuclear weapons capability. The status of each of us as firm allies of the United States helped then, as it does still now, in building uh, trusting and constructive working relationships between us, but they can and there should be more to our political and security relationship than just that. Those cooperative diplomatic exercises have in more recent years been given stronger institutional backup, and that's all to the good. The 2009 joint statement on enhanced global and security cooperation by then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and President Lee Myung Buck resulted in an action plan embracing regular reciprocal ship and aircraft visits, enhanced bilateral exercises, inter-service and defence policy talks, and military intelligence sharing. Arrangements which have now been further spelt out in the 2015 Blueprint for Defence and Security Cooperation. Since 2013, very importantly, we've had in place two plus two bilateral dialogue meetings with our foreign and defence ministers, the most recent of which was uh, in December 2019. And on a wider plurilateral front, we've also had since 2013 the establishment of the MICTA, the MICTA group, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey and Australia, initiated by Korea to bring together a geographically diverse group of G20 members to informally consult and to try to bridge divides on global issues like development, cyber and nuclear security, climate change and environment. I think the kind of cooperative middle power diplomacy which MICTA was designed to advance can be a very important force for peace and stability. And I want to come back to this point in rather more detail in just a moment. But first of all, I have to say something, of course, about the Korean peninsula, because the South Korea's central preoccupation will undoubtedly remain, as has been uh, the case for years, the state of play on the peninsula. Here it remains very much to be seen whether we can translate the steadily growing and intensifying set of bilateral relationships between us into any meaningful role for Australia in future DPRK nuclear negotiations. Australia did play a, a bit part in the past in the agreed framework negotiations, which I've already mentioned, contributing to meeting the North's energy needs, which was part of the hoped for settlement. And we could again in this way. We did participate in the investigation into the 2010 sinking of the Chenan and could again contribute to international monitoring and verification processes that will clearly need to be part of any denuclearization settlement or steps on the way like an agreed freeze on weapons and delivery system development and fissile material production. But clearly when it comes to the negotiations themselves, if they can get seriously started again, we can't expect, we Australia can't expect to play anything much more than a bystander role. The central players will of course be apart from North and South Korea and the United States, China, and to a less extent, the other six party talks participants, Japan and Russia. Well, while President Trump's summit diplomacy proved, as with so much else in his presidency, to be more circus than substance, I've always believed that a credible and sustainable nuclear deal is still doable with Pyongyang, as ugly and as indifferent to normal ethical constraints as that regime undoubtedly continues to be. I think I share that position with the current ROK government, President Moon Jae-in, but uh, my dear colleague Moon Chung-in, uh, who will be speaking on this panel in a moment, will do so with far more authority than I can in this respect. My own perception remains, for what it's worth, that Kim's basic intentions are above all defensive rather than aggressive, that he is focused on regime survival and knows that to be homicidal would be to be suicidal. He knows that he needs major economic progress to maintain his regime's internal credibility and that he genuinely wants, I believe that he genuinely wants the kind of military and diplomatic deal that will help make that possible. Although uh, Kim is unlikely in the short to medium term to commit to anything more than a freeze on fissile material production, the development and testing of weapons and delivery systems, I really don't think it's impossible that he could ultimately agree to full denuclearization in the context of the long sought conclusion of the Korean War Peace Treaty, normalization, genuine normalization of diplomatic relations and significant economic support. 
What matters above all, if any progress is to be made, is the development over time of some genuine trust between the DPRK and its neighbours, and above all, the United States. While we all expect the new Biden administration to be more rational and principled than its predecessor, could hardly be less, its rhetoric so far on North Korea has not shown a lot of disposition to compromise. And it is a real question whether if a softened Pyongyang position does become more apparent, and there are some serious step gains on the table, albeit initially small, but it is, it is a real question whether the United States will be capable of taking yes for an answer. We'll see. Well, while Australia can't expect to be more than a bit player on these North Korea issues, I am persuaded that there's a great deal that we can and should be doing together with South Korea in this general area of middle power diplomacy. And I want to say quite a little bit more about that. Middle powers are best described as those states which are not economically or militarily big or strong enough, either in their own regions or in the wider world, to impose their policy preferences on anyone else but which are nonetheless sufficiently capable, credible, motivated to be able to make an impact on international relations. There's no standard list of current middle powers or any commonly agreed list of objective measures like population size or GDP or military budgets distinguishing military powers from others. But that list would certainly include Australia and the ROK, other members of the MICTA group, Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, as it would Canada and most of the Scandinavians. A perhaps better and not necessarily circular way of identifying middle powers is to describe them as states which practice middle power diplomacy, which has a characteristic motivation and method. The characteristic motivation of middle power diplomacy is belief in the utility and necessity of acting cooperatively cooperatively with others in addressing international challenges, particularly those global or regional public goods problems which by their nature can't be solved by any country acting alone, however big and powerful. And the characteristic diplomatic method of middle power diplomacy is coalition building with like-minded states. Those who, whatever their prevailing value systems, share specific interests and are prepared to work together to do something about them. The contributions that middle powers so acting can make to better international relations include the following, agenda setting, bringing new ideas to the table, which bigger players carrying too much baggage or too stuck in their ways uh, may be able to embrace. For example, in our own region, creation of APEC, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the Australia-Indonesia initiated peace plan for Cambodia. They can engage in bridge building uh, between developed and developing countries, one of the major aspirations, as I've said, of MICTA. And they can engage in building critical masses of support for regional and global public goods and rule-based international order, policy change. Uh, for example, climate change, responsibility to protect against mass atrocity crimes and arms control treaties, like those abolishing uh, cluster bombs and landmines, and also hopefully now nuclear weapons elimination. Although it has to be said that some of the key middle powers are giving rather greater weight to being US allies than being good global citizens. How effective middle powers can be in making a difference depends on a number of factors, resources, creativity, credibility, opportunity in particular. By resources, I mean the need for a reasonably wide network of diplomatic posts and officials with energy and stamina. By creativity, I mean this, what middle powers lack in economic, political or military clout, they can often make up for with quick diplomatic footwork evident in the Asian region again in the creation of new security and economic architecture that we've seen in recent decades, APEC, ARF, EAS, and again the Cambodia Peace Plan, I guess. Credibility is important, the need to avoid hypocrisy by practicing at home what they preach abroad, not least on human rights and democracy issues. And here it has to be said that within MICTA, Turkey is now particularly vulnerable in this respect. Allies of great powers like Australia also have a little bit of a credibility problem. They, we have to be perceived as having some real independence, not just acting as a cipher or stalking force for a great protector if we are to have any influence. And finally, opportunity matters. While there have been many past examples in our region of effective middle power diplomacy, we do have to recognise that in an Asian setting, where great or major power rivalry, above all now between China and the US, but also Japan and China, China and India, India and Pakistan, does provide so much of the context and dynamics. Here, the scope for middle powers to be 
really influential on the really big piece of security issues may be limited. That said, while recognizing the reality of limited opportunity, let me finally offer nonetheless three examples which the middle powers of this region, very much including us, Australia and Korea, are both capable of being leading players in this respect and in where, in my judgment, we could have a significant impact. The first of those three issues is setting the agenda for the East Asian Summit, which although its potential as a regional cooperation organisation has so far not been fully realised, it does have all the ingredients, in my view, to become the preeminent regional dialogue and policy-making body, containing, as the, A the EAS now does, all the major regional players, including now the United States and Russia, meeting at leader level and mandated to address both economic and political issues. Its 18 members include a majority, in fact, middle powers. Most of the ASEANs, Australia and Korea, New Zealand also can be characterised in this respect, um, at least because of its tradition of multilateral activism. The second thing I think we can be doing as middle powers in this region, Australia and Korea in particular, is helping to really visibly push back against excessive Chinese assertiveness and overreach, including in the South China Sea. While China manifestly doesn't want to provoke violent conflict anywhere, it is clearly intent on recreating as much of the historic hegemonic tributary relationships with its southern and perhaps eastern neighbours as well that it can get away with. And a united front of middle powers might, in my judgment, be more effective actually in resisting this than relying so much now on the United States that is, among other things, still very reluctant to stop asserting not just its presence, but its primacy. There's been much talk of the Quad in this context, India, Australia, Japan, and the United States, uh, showing a united front diplomatically and to some extent militarily with joint exercises and the like. And I don't oppose continuing to cautiously develop that cooperation. But I am rather more attracted in this context to developing a united front grouping which would harness the collective middle power energy and capacity of a larger number of regional states, of real regional substance, not all of them necessarily democracies, in which, for example, India, Australia, and Japan would be joined by Korea, by Indonesia, and Vietnam. And finally, some of us are in a position, I think, to influence the global nuclear weapons elimination debate and should do more than we have in this respect. Had Australia and Korea, along with our larger neighbour Japan, been willing to support President Obama's move towards a no-first-use commitment, the world might have taken a significant step toward reducing the salience and legitimacy of the most indiscriminately inhumane and existentially threatening weapons ever invented. The support of the Central and European NATO allies would probably also have been necessary in that respect, but the East Asians were crucial. There is a big job to be done in bridging the gap between those who, on the one hand, in the nuclear context, will settle only for the kind of absolutism that's embodied in the Nuclear Ban Treaty, and on the other hand, the nuclear armed states and those sheltering under their protection who want essentially no movement at all on disarmament. Working for a meaningful and achievable halfway house solution with a credible, not an incredible, roadmap towards ultimate elimination is a task in which I seriously think Australia and Korea can be quintessentially important players. Well, finally, raw economic and political power will always count for a lot in international affairs, but it doesn't count for everything. Middle powers with a sense of where we want to go and with the credibility, the resources and the energy to follow through can have a major impact in making this region and the wider world safer and saner. That's the challenge as I see it for both Korea and Australia. And I believe that by working ever more closely together to strengthen the many bonds that we already share, we can in fact deliver on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth, for sharing your typically sharp analysis with us. Our next keynote speaker is Professor Chung In Moon. Professor Moon is Special Advisor in Foreign Affairs and National Security to the President of the Republic of Korea. Professor Moon is also a Distinguished University Professor of Yonsei University in Seoul, Krauss Distinguished Fellow at University of California, San Diego, and Vice Chair and Executive Director of the Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. Professor Moon is currently serving as the Editor-in-Chief of Global Asia, 
a quarterly publication of the East Asia Foundation. In 2017, Professor Moon was nominated by ROK President Moon Jae-in as a special advisor on unification, diplomacy, and national security affairs. Professor chung in Moon, we are delighted that you can join us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Dan, and thank you very much, Professor Jirika, and Council General Hong, and uh, Professor Chung, and particularly Susan Lee. She has been really helping Korean studies programs throughout you know, Australia and even Southeast Asia. And I'm very much indebted to, you know, chair, chairwoman Susan Lee, and also Garrett Evans. In fact, Garrett is a chairman of APLN and I'm serving as a vice chairman. And I would say that the APLN is a, you know, a good example of Australia ROK cooperation. We are trying to come up with solutions to solve the, you know, WMD weapons of mass destruction, you know, problem problems. And in Australia, you know, you know, in fact, Garrett initiated that project, and I have been really helping him. But uh, that is kind of perfect example of middle power, you know, cooperation. Since Garrett talked about the Australian and South Korean relations, I'll be really focusing on the China-U.S. rivalry really emerging in the context of COVID-19. And I will talk about what is the South Korean choices. And then finally, I will talk about what is room for cooperation between Australia and South Korea. The Trump administration gave real hard time to us because as you all know that, uh, and Australia is going through that process too. When China and the United States in bad relations, we become you know, victims. Okay. And there is a Sri Lankan proverb in where the elephant fights and all the grass got you know, destroyed. Like uh, also, you know, or waste fighting can make uh, you know, shrimps in you know, the back blown out kind of things. And we are in that kind of you know, situation. We have become kind of collateral damages to China US rivalry. But the you know, whole story goes with you know, the Michael Pompeo. He gave a very famous speech at the Nixon Museum on July 23rd last year. And he gave five point why uh, United States should come from China. First, ideological reason. Uh, Chinese Communist Party is a source of all evils. Okay. And unless we change China, China will change the world. And he came up with all this uh, idea of anti-communism as a kind of slogan for confronting China. That is why people talk about the current confrontation between China and the United States a new Cold War. Ideological underpinning was a so-called uh, you know, downwards Chinese communism. And then, and obviously geopolitical you know, consideration. And the trans Trump administration uh, uh, regarded China as a major revisionist power challenging American position. And one road, one back road is seen as a, in a subtle form of challenging American hegemony. And also Chinese behavior in China, South China Sea, you know, East China Sea, cross strait relations all show that uh, China is a challenging American hegemonic position. And um, Trump administration solution is simple, contain China. Okay. And another you know, third dimension is a geoeconomic dimension. Okay. Uh, the U.S. has been suffering from the chronic trade deficit with China, and then Trump administration thought that there is a result of unfair trade practices, okay, and industrial spy, as theft, thefting of intellectual property right, and all these kinds of things. And the American solution, Trump administration solution to that problem is what decouple. China from global supply chain. And the United States has been putting a lot of pressures on South Korea to divert our investment and trade you know, from China. But China accounted for 25% of our total trade, the number one trading partner. It is not easy for us to decouple China from our you know, supply chain. But anyhow, that is one big issue. And fourth in the dimension is technology dimension. And you can clearly, clearly see the clash of techno-nationalism. And American concern 
is fourfold. First, uh, Chinese technological progress is really undercutting American competitiveness. The, for the sake of American competitiveness, China need, uh, the US needs to uh, uh, contain and China. Another issue is what national security concern because of 5 to far away and others really undercutting American national security. And third concern is uh, technology standard. Okay, and the China, Chinese government has come up with a, you know, China standard 2035. And, you know, in 5G and the GPS system, now China has a Beidou, Beidou, you know, system. They're China trying to set its own technological standard by 2035. And United States see that as a major challenge to American technological hegemony. And finally, the value issue, okay? All this uh, you know, democracy in Hong Kong and human rights violations in Xinjiang, and that has been the problem. Therefore, you know, you know the Trump administration set the five fronts, ideology, geopolitics, geoeconomics, and techno nationalism and value. And what happened under the Biden administration? Biden administration, in, in, administration is not like to follow the path taken by the Trump, but the Trump administration has created quite formidable past dependency toward the new Cold War, which Biden, which Biden, the Biden administration would be very difficult to get away from it. And I would say that the trap uh, you know, cold, new Cold War, you know, kind of institutionalized by the Trump administration is posing major challenge to Biden administration. But when you analyze overall, you know, narratives of the key members of Biden administration, uh, the Biden administration is likely to pursue much more flexible approach. Uh, it will pursue cooperation with China on climate change, pandemic, weapons of mass destruction, North Korea nuclear issue. There is a cooperation dimension clearly. It's not like a, not like a Trump administration which pursued a very much dichotomous good and evil kind of approach. That's a good thing. But there is another dimension of competition. Trade and technology, you know, President Biden made it very clear, will compete with China on fair basis. Okay, and that's why President Trump pledged to invest in a huge r and in a fund to enhance technological foundation of you know, United States. Okay, and therefore trade and you know, technology, Trump, Biden administration may follow some of you know, steps which the Biden administration took, but it will be much more flexible in dealing with China. But third dimension is a confrontational dimension. That is the geopolitics issues and value issues. Of course, you know, uh, the folks who work for the Biden administration, they're smart and they know China very well. They will not touch uh, the issue of you know, anti-communism. They would not come up with a rhetoric saying that uh, down with the Chinese Communist Party. I really don't think the Biden administration would do that. However, uh, Biden administration will follow traditional liberal and a platform of democracy and human rights. Therefore, it will be tough on the democracy in Hong Kong issue. It will be tough on the, you know, what Mike Pompeo called the genocide in Xinjiang. Uh, therefore, in those areas, you know, uh, we can clearly see there will be a growing tension. Okay, between China and the United States. In fact, if you look at the you know, first one week's behavior of the Biden administration, the United States has been taking much more assertive posture in the South China Sea. And also the United States has been assuring some kinds of you know, transparency, not strategic ambiguity, which the Obama administration uh, pursued. Okay, it will be much more transparent, trans what I call the strategic parents as transparency. Therefore, there will be in a conflict and cooperation. And I, Biden administration is not likely to treat China as an enemy, unlike the Trump administration. However, 
the Biden administration will treat China as a major rival. And also, if you read in a, uh, writings by the Jake Sullivan and Kurt Campbell, who will be playing the major role in shaping Biden administration ASEAN policy, their basic idea is this, that China will be trying to consolidate its hegemonic position in Asia Pacific first, and then move on to the global in a comp hegemonic competition with the United States. As the United States took that path in early 19th century, and Germany did the same thing, okay? And even Japan followed the similar path. Therefore, they argue that China will be following similar path. Therefore, uh, their prescription, prescription is very clear cut. Let us just encircle and contain China in Asia Pacific first. Therefore, the Biden administration is likely to pursue quad approach, quad plus approach, and it will be much more assertive in containing China in the Asia Pacific theater. Uh, therefore, in the sense, you know, uh, but again, you know, geopolitics and value are the two most important you know, directives of American foreign policy. Therefore, I really don't think any moderation of China-US confrontation even under the Biden administration. Then under this situation, South Korean choice is what? Obviously, the you know, great majority of South Koreans, particularly conservative people argue that we should take side with the United States. We should pursue pro-American balancing strategy against China, okay? And it is more so because a lot of people fear the uh, tragedy of a philandization, okay? Therefore, one group argued in that way, but there's some much smaller group, particularly historians, they argue that, uh, look, American hegemony is declining, okay? China is rising. And by year 2035, you know, China will be, you know, uh, superseding the United States in terms of economic, you know, power. Therefore, it is wise for us to take side with China. Therefore, bandwagoning China has been another strategy which was suggested by the mostly historians and some journalists. And third approach is just some nationalists in South Korea argue that we should stand alone. How can we stand alone? Con ultra conservatives argue that we should have a nuclear weapons and we should declare new middle powers and nuclear weapons. But progressives argue that we should pursue permanent, neutral permanent neutrality, like Switzerland, okay, or Austria. Okay, and so that we can get out of all this block in the diplomacy. But their voice is so small and very much unheard. Fourth approach is what I call the status quo approach or muddling through approach. Grand majority of Koreans, South Koreans support that idea. Then means what? Security with the United States, economy with China. We should be able to muddle through conflicting points of US-China rivalry, okay? By pursuing strategic ambiguity or by pursuing, you know, double hedging in a, in a strategy. But this approach worked during the days of President Kim Dae-jung. But at the time, Jiang Zemin and Clinton were in good terms. And President Kim Dae-jung was in very good terms with uh, President Jiang Zemin and President you know, Clinton. But when the China-US relations get worsened, this kind of opportunistic posture uh, may not work. Then finally, I personally argue that we need to pursue some kind of transcending strategy, which is similar to what uh, uh, Professor Garrett Evans you know, suggested. That is what, we are trapped in the block diplomacy, diplomacy. We should find out to overcome this block diplomacy. Otherwise, we'll be, you know, for prey to in you know, the balance of power determinism. We should get out of it. And how can we do that? We should pursue multilateralism and global office. And we should pursue open regionalism for integration and cooperation. Okay. And by doing what? By coming with new ideas, new knowledges, by developing new norms, principles, rules, procedures, in other words, creating some form of you know, international and regional regimes. I, of course, in doing that, 
we should consolidate our alliance with the United States. Why? Because in South Korea alone cannot pursue this multilateralism and open regionalism. We should cooperate with someone else. With whom? Australia, Japan, Canada, and even extending to Europe in you know, a Great Britain, France, Germany, which in a cabin word called so-called M7 or M11, multilateral seven or multilateral 11. Okay, we may be including multilateral 11, M11. And I think that is the, the only way we can assure our you know, survival, peace and prosperity. Then here comes the imperative for Australian South Korean cooperation. As Professor Garrett Evans pointed out, we need the more creative middle power diplomacy. And South Korea and Australia should sit together and come up with joint ideas on how to avoid this US-China new Cold War rivalry. What role should the middle powers play? And I think that should be the most important one, okay? And if American allies such as South Korea, Australia, Japan, Canada, you know, work together in New Zealand, work together and come up with an idea because we are dependent on China too, okay? We are American allies, but we have been strategic partners, uh, partners with, you know, China. We, if we can come up with a collective voice, I think that we can influence Washington and Beijing so that we can, you know, make in such a way that these big superpowers avoid the, you know, game of chicken, okay? And in this, in the sense that then Australia and South Korea work very closely, and even we should develop, you know, uh, that kind of agenda. And I don't know current government in Australia, but uh, when Garrett was serving as a foreign foreign affairs minister, and he did, particularly on you know R two P, you know, right to protect, you know, all this multilateral agenda setting, Australia did it, South Korea supported it, okay. And as he pointed out, you know. Uh, APEC is another good example. In other words, uh, uh, South Korea, if South Korea and South Korea work together, we can come up with a new innovative and imaginative ideas to foster multilateralism and open regionalism so that we can avoid being trapped in the superpower rivalry between Washington and Beijing in the form of a new Cold War. Thank you. I'll stop here. Well, thank you, Professor Moon, for your exemplary keynote address. So, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, you've heard two stunning talks, and they're both incredibly compatible. Professor Evans focused on middle powers. Well, Professor Moon largely talked about the dynamic between the two global superpowers and how that affects the region. So this is an opportunity for your questions. I've got one question that's come through uh, on the device through to me, but I'd like to invite you to ask any question that uh, you might have from these, uh, this is your opportunity really to, to get some further insights from these, uh, these two great experts on the region, but there are also other people, uh, other distinguished guests that have been introduced as well who may want to have their say too. Uh, amazingly, for an event like this, we have stuck to time. Um, I, I was supposed to uh, thank, thank Professor Moon at 6.53, and that's exactly what I did. I think it's probably 6.54 now, but thank you so much. And um, everyone has stuck to time and therefore we have at least 15 or 20 minutes for a question and answer session. So I do encourage you to take advantage of that. So I don't know whether whether we have Professor Gareth Evans with us. Is he hearing us? Do we know? Uh, I, I hope so. Me. Oh, that's good. Sorry, Gareth. We can... I don't know whether you've got my picture or not. I can't seem to bring it up. No, that's fine. Well, we'll, th that's good. So as long as you can hear us, because the first question is for you, Gareth. And it's quite a long question, so I'll do my best to summarize it. Uh, you talked very much about how middle powers could be part of the solution. But the question is really asking, well, the middle powers have been around for a while. So, so what has been preventing them from collaborating to solve some of these regional problems before now? Well, I think it's just a, a lack of recognition by the political leaderships of so many countries um, so often as to the real creative potential of these middle power alliances. Every now and again, uh, the penny does drop and the mood does strike. And we do get these cooperative exercises which are brilliantly successful. I think of the um, 
you know, the Oslo and Ottawa movements on landmines and cluster bombs, which were quintessentially middle power enterprises, which have borne real fruit in terms of significant arms control achievements. And, um, you know, I do think of the kind of uh, cooperation that I mentioned um, in a regional context in which um, Australia, with support very strongly from Indonesia, was able to uh, mobilize a real constituency for solving a major regional security problem in, uh, in Cambodia. There's plenty of examples, if you go back through the, the course of history, um, of that effective kind of cooperation. I think um, there's no institutional inhibition. Um, there's no sort of nothing in the water which stops this sort of cooperation taking place. It's just a matter of recognizing its utility and grabbing the moment. I mean, we're seeing this, of course, now in the context of um, climate change, where so much of the energy uh, for this over the years has come from the, the middle powers that have been agitating for the big guys to get their act together. Now, China and hopefully the US under Biden will honour that sort of confidence that recognise their own obligations and get moving. But, um, you know, I, I really do think there are many, many occasions where this sort of cooperative coalition building can bear real fruit. I, I mentioned it in the context of standing up to China. I mean, none of the middle powers between us have anything like the military clout that the United States can single-handedly bring to bear. But uh, in terms of getting a very strong message across to China, um, that its relationships are really dependent on more than just the exercise of crude authority. Uh, and if you get pushback from a significant number of regional powers, who not only between them can muster significant uh, military credibility, but nonetheless can give very, quite apart from that, can give very strong messages um, you know, to the regional, new regional superstar, that um, that kind of tributary seeking hegemony is, is not what these countries want. So um, I think just the, the messaging, it, it really just is a matter of, um, the political leaderships in each of these countries recognizing the potential for creativity and cooperation and getting on with with doing it um, many examples in the past there can be in the future it waxes and wanes the extent to which um, the mood is there to do this but i think the time is there for that mood to be regenerated and i think korea and australia between us uh, can be leaders in uh, in generating that momentum again and I gave three or four examples of where I think we could cooperate successfully uh, to really make a difference. Thank you, Gareth. The second question, and I don't have the identity of the questioner, so I'm sorry I'm not able to say who, who it's coming from. But the second question is from, for Professor Moon. And the second question is really about the, open, you, the idea of open regionalism, which you so eloquently talked about. The question is really whether middle powers are too connected and too aligned to their superpower relationships to be able to play that sort of key neutral role in an open regional community. What would you say about the relationship, those relationships and how they might compromise middle power diplomacy? Uh, most of middle powers are American allies. That is a great asset for us because we can persuade the United States. If the United States does the wrong thing, then we can tell them in collectivity, not the right way of doing things. And also at the same time, once we have an influence over Washington, we can have an influence over Beijing too. But now there are no so-called middlemen between the two superpowers. Therefore, American allies, you know, we are basically you know, pro-Americans because we have a shared values and all these kinds of things. And also the United States would trust in us. If South Korea does alone, then those guys in Washington will argue that, oh, you're working for China. But in, if Australia, South Korea, New Zealand, Japan can work together, then U.S. cannot make you know, that kind of you know, complaints. That is why I think, you know, uh, using that kind of mechanism, we can come up with some kinds of alternatives to, you know, dilute the tension between Beijing and Washington or, you know, avoid that kinds of confrontation. Thank, thank you, Professor Moon. Um, the, the other question that's come through is very much seeking examples for how um, Korean, Australian, or, or ROK, I guess, uh, Korea, Australian relations can, can survive this hostile 
competitive relationship between the two superpowers. Um, so, and I guess that again goes back to your talk, Professor Moon, where you really made a very eloquent argument that Biden's America may not look too more, too much more uh, hospitable, really, to middle power diplomacy, possibly than the the, the, the Trump era. Um, so, perhaps some concrete examples: civil society, universities, the corporate sector. Should we be looking to build the relationship really from below? Would that be something that would have the support of Professor Moon? Uh, I would say Trump? that is the most important. Uh, there is a most important aspect. Civil society should be mobilized. For example, uh, you know, uh, Professor Gary Evans wrote a very interesting column, column at uh, you know, the Korea Times. And he argues that, for example, American proposal have a D10, Democracy 10, excluding China. Even, you know, Quad plus, that may not be a good idea. You, if you exclude China, China will be much more hostile and confrontational. Therefore, instead of the kinds of exclusive regional strategy, we should come up with some kinds of inclusive strategy. RCEP, one good example, regional economic partnership, even you know, CPTPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And if we include you know, you know, China, South Korea will join it definitely. And I think that kind of inclusive approach is very needed. But if you look at the political dynamics in Washington, that won't work. Then all the Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Japan, they can remind those guys in Washington that, that there is another way. You know, without excluding China, we can find some solution. There is a kind of, you know, there should be kinds of collective work and collective deliberation between Canberra and Seoul. Is there anything, Gareth, you'd like to, to add? Is there anything, Gareth, you'd like to add to, to that response? No, I think um, the example I gave of the, the nuclear issue and getting a very clear message to the United States from its middle power allies that it's got to get serious about disarmament would be crucial. I, I made the point that under Obama, Obama really was tempted to go down the path of a doctrinal change, a commitment to no first use, which would have been a massive stimulus towards a, a nuclear weapon free world. But um, I'm afraid we had real difficulties with um, the political forces that were work in the key uh, allies, both in the East Asian region and Australia itself was very nervous and unhappy about the risks to ex extended nuclear deterrence. And of course the, um, the NATO allies in Central and Eastern Europe were the same. I think that's one classic area because Biden is obviously tempted again um, to go down that particular path, but he's not going to do it without a clear message from his middle power allies in the region. And I hope that uh, Korea and Australia and with chung and I working together in the APLN uh, can help make a difference in that respect. Uh, but, uh, but overall, I mean, all of us have got to be less reliant on the might of the United States and we'd be more self-reliant and we've got to be more reliant on each other and cooperative solidarity of, uh, of joint behavior together in the face of these threats and risks. So I often, uh, I often state the mantra for Australian foreign policy as being for the future, less America, more self-reliance, more Asia and more global engagement. And uh, so I don't, I don't think we should get hung up on the alliance issue, but recognize that we do have some real leverage within the alliance to move, uh, move the United States on really big issues if we can get our own act together. That's great, thank you, thank you, Gareth. Um, I'm waiting for other questions or comments to come through the feed, and uh, while we do that and see if there's anything else anyone wants to ask, I might just ask whether Susan Lee or the Consul General would like to add any comments to the keynote addresses that they've heard. Susan Lee, would you like to, is there anything you would like to respond to? Hi, Susan. Uh Sorry, Susan, we, we're not hearing you. Maybe your mic needs to go on. Oh, I'm sorry, we're, we're still not hearing you. So perhaps one oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we are yeah, now. Thank it's you. Okay, yeah, yeah, it was great. Uh, my colleague just um, sent an uh, actually um, a question, but we couldn't do it. We, we couldn't log in. So can I read um, Mr. Ju's question? Uh, People on the chat room. Have you have you received a question from Mr. Chu? 
I can't see who the questions are. Um, from, the, because the questions are very long, I've had to I've had to summarize them. All right. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't. It, it's in the chat room. Can you hear me? Or yeah, yeah. So sure. well. I have a question to Professor Gas Evans. That sure. can you hear me? No, yes, I yes, can. can. I'm sorry, yeah. you can't see me. Yeah, yeah. I need a ten-year-old sitting on my lap to help with all this stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> God, God, let us get out of this Zoom right. nonsense and get back to real-world interactions. But uh, anyway, I'm sorry, Mr. Jew. Away you go. Yes. I can hear you. Um, South Korean president has been pushing for the replacement of the existing armistice agreement with that. Uh, permanent peace agreement. What do you think about it? Well, I think it's overdue for that kind of big step forward to be made. It would be courageous, I guess, for the South Koreans and the Americans to put that on the table without extracting some whopping great big reciprocal concession uh, from the North Koreans. But I really do think uh, it sounds soft, but I think we've got to be in the business of rebuilding trust and confidence. And um, there just hasn't been a willingness in the past uh, to really do the kind of things that um, really are important to the North Koreans. And above all, they're anxious about regime survival. Above all, they're anxious about potential military threats. And if we in the South and in the West and with America can take some really serious steps to assuage that concern, then I think, uh, I think the game uh, really could change. Now, you know, I don't want to be very precise about armistice versus full treaty and this step versus that step, but um, I do think the instinct that I know Chung In shares, and I know uh, President Moon Jae-in shares and the present South Korean government shares to, uh, you know, to get some serious um, concessions on the table or some gestures on the table, some confidence building measures on the table from our side and not just wait for stuff to happen on the other side uh, is the way forward. I know there's plenty of voices in uh, Korea that uh, Chung In has to deal with all the time that are deeply, deeply opposed to making any concession of any kind until you get almost a full denuclearization package in front of you. But um, I, I remember going back to the, uh, you know, the, the keto period that um, we really weren't very good in meeting our own obligations and um, you know in terms of supplying fuel oil and opening up the diplomatic relations that were promised and a whole variety of small steps you know there was a lot of foot dragging on the american on the western on the uh, on the allied side and uh, under those circumstances uh, we did just over time uh, sacrifice the trust as such a crucial ingredient ingredient in any kind of um, serious negotiation. So yes, I, I would want that peace stuff very much center front in terms of a renewed approach to uh, getting negotiations started. But Chung In's much more reliable on this stuff than I am. And I think you should take notice of him rather than me. Uh, Darren has become the, the spokesman for the Moon Jae-in government. Right. <laughs> Moon Jae-in government position is exactly the same as the Professor Garrett Evans in a prescription. So, so I'm going to move to the to the last question, uh, at least from from this round, which is a short, punchy question. Can we boycott China and trade with India and Indonesia instead? Well, I, I suspect the we there is Australia. But anyway, can we boycott China and trade with India and Indonesia instead? I can see lots of downside risks, but over to the panel. South Korea cannot boycott. We are too dependent on China. It will take time, but the uh, current, and also, you know, if we boycott China and China retaliate, mm. then the victims will be small, medium firms and the poor merchant on the street, you rely, relying on Chinese, you know, tourist. Therefore, politically, it will be extremely difficult for South Korean government to boycott China. Yeah. Well, similarly for, for Australia, I mean, nearly 40% of our exports go to China. We're hugely, hugely dependent on that relationship. Um, we could boycott and sales of our agricultural products and our coal and a variety of other things, our wine and so on, and it wouldn't make the heapeth of difference to China because all those things are able to be sourced elsewhere. If we stopped supplying iron ore to China, that would cause real pain because that's the real need for China at the moment. It can't get what it wants from Brazil and the, the big potential deposits in West Africa are still a very, very long way from fruition. So, uh, you know, there is a sense in which um, trade in iron ore is 
very much in both China's and Australia's interest. But the, the whole talk of boycott, I think, is um, is a luxury that can be enjoyed by those countries who don't have anything like the degree of economic dependence that countries like um, Korea and Australia do, and indeed every other country in our region. Nobody wants to go down that particular path. All of us want to get a restoration of sanity, um, get some decency back into the equation, reduce the stridency um, of the dialogue, recognize that there are some reasonable aspirations that China has to be part of the rule making business, not just be a rule taker. We have to recognize all those things while still being uh, very keen to push back on Chinese over-assertiveness in the South China Sea and Chinese misbehavior economically, which is significant in terms of its protective and other activity. And also, of course, it's, uh, it's really, really ugly human rights violations. But we can do all of that stuff um, without cutting off our economic nose to completely uh, spite our face. It'd just be a glorious exercise in self-sacrifice that um, would make no discernible difference to Chinese behavior for either Australia or Korea to go down that particular path. Thank you, Professor Evans, for that fabulous answer to that question. And I would just like to now see if the, the Consul General would like to comment on anything that he's heard before we move to the next stage of the event. Consul General? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chancellor Don. Uh, it was very interesting and enlightening in the session and discussion. Uh, I just would like to say that I think it's, it's a time for us to take some more uh, flexible approach to derive a creation solution for uh, in the uh, to uh, give the uh, new momentum for the peace process in the Korean Peninsula to find out more compromising solution. Uh, most important country, the uh, trust building is very crucial. So that's why the, we, the, the South Korean government uh, has uh, made a tremendous effort for uh, trust building uh, uh, with, uh, with North Korea. Uh, and we have uh, trying to be a very uh, the honest broker for, uh, for the negotiation between the United States and North Korea. Uh, the current statement uh, in the denuclearization uh, negotiation uh, comes from the lack of mutual trust. That's why we need to be more uh, proactive to resume the, the whole dialogue. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those remarks. I, I've often thought the comparison between Ostpolitik in the early 1970s through to the end of the Cold War was so critical to, the, to the, 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 the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and the unification of, of Europe. And I've often thought that we, sh as scholars really, should draw a little bit more on historical parallels where deeply divided countries and, and regions have actually managed to build the trust that you're, you're talking about. It could be a very exciting research project maybe for the center to consider in the future. And at this point in this fascinating event, I'm, I'm delighted to hand over to Honorary Associate Professor Jae-Hoon Jung, Jae Hoon is the co-director of the Korean Study Center here at UQ. And along with his fellow director, Mr. Isaac Lee, Dr. Isaac Lee, he's been instrumental in attracting both funding and support for the center over its 12 months of operation. Jae Hoon is going to update us on the center's future programs. So Associate Professor Jae Hoon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Tim. Yeah, uh, I'd like to express my sincere thanks uh, to today's eminent speakers, uh, Professor Evans and Professor Moon, for your inspiring presentation. And my special thanks to uh, Ms. Sojan Lee and Consul General Mr. Sang Hong for your kind remarks and support to, support to our Korean uh, Study Center. I also appreciate uh, all the, uh, all the attendance uh, for your particip participation this evening. It has been a year since uh, uh, Korean, UQ Korean Studies uh, Center has opened uh, in February uh, 2020, last year. Just uh, uh, a couple of weeks before the COVID-19 lockdown. Since the inception until now, we are limited uh, to undertake uh, planned activities of the center. However, the center has been successful in hosting the, uh, the webinars uh, on Korean studies, uh, including tonight's excellent talk. I'm pleased uh, to announce that the center, the Korean Study Center will continue to host uh, the monthly webinars this year. Please uh, refer to the screen 
uh, for our, uh, let me share the screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, please uh, refer to this screen, uh, which will be hosted uh, in collaboration with our partner institutions this year. Uh, particularly uh, April, uh, we have an uh, uh, interesting talk on uh, Australian missionaries' uh, contribution to social development of Korea uh, in 80, 1889 to now. Uh, the case of Gyeongsang area and its implication to human rights of North Korea. Uh, I'd like to uh, look forward to having you in these upcoming uh, webinars again. We'll keep you informed of them. Uh, lastly, I thank all my colleagues here at UQ who made this webinar successful. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd now like to invite my, my friend and colleague, Professor Heather Zwicker, Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, to close this particular event. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you very much, everybody, particularly to our two keynote speakers. You have convinced us of the importance of middle power diplomacy in the context of intellectual superpowers. So I think that has been one of the big takeaways um, for this evening. Very, very interesting conversation. Very grateful to everyone who has spoken and also to all of you who were able to um, come and attend the webinar this evening. I realized that there were some technical difficulties getting into the room at the beginning. So I did want to note that we've recorded the session and we will be distributing it to anyone who wants to catch up again or hear the bits that they missed. But for now, it's my, um, it's my somewhat mixed pleasure to draw us to a close for this. Thank you very much, Professor.